to just be able to sit quietly um, with oneself, in oneself, being oneself, is a gift. Um, because usually what tends to be there is a consistent, unrelenting movement of thought which keeps us disconnected from ourself. And that movement of, of thought includes in it a conceptual sense of self that is essentially not content with itself and with uh, life that it is continuously thinking about and commenting on, judging and essentially feeling separate and uncomfortable with. And so the sitting silently that I'm speaking about is when there is the absence of that, it's, uh, the absence of that thinking. And it's effortless. It happens and it becomes available to us when a portal, a dimension, an aspect, any all these different words um, of ourself, a dimension of ourself opens up, reveals itself, becomes available, um, and in resting there, in being connected to that part of ourself there is a repositioning out of the thinking mind into what we could call the heart or the self into being outside of thinking prior to thinking And that aspect of our self knows itself as something more real than what we previously uh, experienced ourself as. And this is why seeking is often referred to as a search for the truth. a recognition of that which is real. And one of the um, definitions or rules that can be useful in seeking truth is uh, that which doesn't change. That which doesn't come and go. If something is here one minute and then disappears and then reappears, it can't be real, at least from a certain perspective. Um, we have to uh, understand that that which is real can't not be there. It can't change. If it changes, then what was before can't be said to be real because it's no longer 
no longer what it was. Now, obviously, this definition is not necessarily uh, something, some definition that is absolute, but it's very useful, a definition, and I'd say very valid a definition when it comes to seeking the self. And it's very useful because we can start looking for all the things that change, all the things that are variable, that are not constant. And if we can understand why we can't be something that is changing, that what we are at our core must be more constant than something that is fleeting, then that means there's a conviction for us to stop identifying with aspects of the manifestation that are very obviously always changing. We can start to relate to those aspects of the manifestation as not truth, not real. I'd suggest this is why there is a resonance in us when we hear that liberation is a seeking for that which is true that there is this appeal, this resonance, this longing, this yearning inside of us. Ah, that's what I want. Maybe it's because intuitively, on a deep level, we know that what we are is truth. What we are at our core is something real and unchanging, something invulnerable. That which is unchanging, that which is constant, is not vulnerable to, this, to the components of life that are changing. And I think it's fair to say that the hypnotism that's happened the divine hypnotism is a hypnosis of identifying with those aspects that are changing and confusing ourselves to be that. And for as long as there is this confusion that I can be this that is changing, then that that is constant, that which doesn't change, goes unnoticed, goes overlooked. And so if it feels appropriate, I would stick with, um, put, put the definition, that which is real, is ever-present and unchanging. It doesn't come and go. You can put that in the bag of tricks. And if the notion that what we are at our core, that the essence of the human being or the essence of what we really are is truth, is real, is not illusory. Then we can use these two resonating factors to help us along the way. If what I am is true and real, then I must be unchanging. I must be ever-present and constant. And I can't be 
that which is subject to change, that which is subject to coming and going. And that might allow a, an awareness of aspects of daily life that are changing to be seen as changing. Take our thoughts, for example, our beliefs, our feelings, our emotions. Or more usefully, when doing this investigation, we might stop calling them my feelings, my thoughts, my beliefs, and just look at them as objects. And then we also have to question, who is it that looks at the thoughts? Is it another thought that is looking at the thought? Because it can very easily be that our seeking is a seeking where a thought has a thought about a thought. Or a thought is a thought about a thought. And witnessing, which is the very function of what we are at our core, that which is real, is not thought. It is not that which comes and goes. And we might notice in this investigation, an investigation that hopefully becomes not an intellectual investigation, but a movement of being that which is aware of everything that comes and goes. In that movement, in that investigation, we might see how habitual it is to identify with the thinking as if that is what I am, as if I am the thinker that is thinking about life and that knows life through my analysis and my thought about what is seen. And if we keep in mind, I am not that which comes and goes, I am not that which is subject to change. There may be that movement of thought, which very often includes in it the I thought, uh, I like this, or I am witnessing. I am going to find the truth or I am the one that is being victimized by my friends or my family or by society. I am the one that is really um, lost in life, not achieving what I should achieve. All of that is thought that includes a, a, a pronoun that becomes the quasi-subject. And maybe what we really are is prior to all of that, um, made of a completely different essence. And the hypnosis of knowing ourself as the thinker as the feelings, as the emotions, may be um, a habit that keeps us existing on a dimension that's far more fragile and vulnerable than 
that which we really are. And in seeing that there's this habit, this movement that has formed, I mean, we didn't really um, set out to know ourselves this way. It just happened. And in that happening and in our seeing this, um, the, the fact that that is how we know ourselves as thought, as feelings, as the body, we might realize how hard it is to, or how unavailable it might seem to know ourselves any other way. And so the tip, the hint, is that what we really are is not on the level of thinking. It's prior to thought. And that this movement of knowing ourself as thought is a movement that keeps us disconnected from that. And even the um, desire to be free of thinking can sometimes manifest as a movement that is, oh, I want to be free of thinking, and so I'm going to do it. And the very act of doing it, the only way we know how is to think more about how to do it and try hard to do it. And if grace is to land, to shower down on us, in that moment, what we find is a, a, a tipping of the scales. A movement happens inside that is different. I would refer to it as falling backwards into ourselves. And the falling backwards is falling out of a doing. And that falling out happens in the moment when there is a recognition that the, the thinking, the trying to get somewhere, which may not even be seen as thought, in the moment it is seen as thought, there's a flash that realizes that a stop
And in that stopping, there is a direct experience of what is happening right now prior to the, the layer of thought, prior to the filter of thought. And in that experiencing, that being of what is here now, there is a knowing that what I am that is aware of what is here now is not separate from everything that is arising. That everything that is known in this moment is made of and arising within what I am. And that's not a, a concept. It's the undeniable truth that is beyond concept. The impersonal sense of I am. Not the thought, I am, but the experiential, direct sense of being. So for as long as seeking continues to be the seeking of the doer entity, then the seeking is maintaining the identification with that which is separate, that which is apart from everything else. If a barking arises in the present moment, the barking has to be within what I am for it to be known. If a bird is seen flying across the horizon, the bird has to be within what I am for it to be known and for a whole lifetime we have been looking at a bird as being outside of what I am because the rep repetitive notion I am the body has been set in place and so the bird appears to be outside of the body the barking sound appears to be outside of the body far away so to investigate around the notion that everything that is known, not intellectually known as in knowledge about subjects, uh, facts and figures, but that which is a known, that is known in the present moment, the multi-sensory experience, all of the sight, the sound, the smells, the tastes, the touch, 
the thoughts, the emotions, all of that that we can refer to as objects or the manifest arise within what I am. It's the only way they can be known. Everything that is outside of what I am is not known in the present moment, is not here, doesn't arise as part of the manifestation. So the barks that are not within what I am won't arise as sound in the present moment. So a very simple pointer like that can change in an instant how we know ourselves, how the present moment is experienced. We can go in an instant from knowing ourselves as an object to the knowledge, the direct, undeniable knowledge that I am that in which everything arises. And knowing that nothing that arises within what I am is separate from what I am. And that everything that arises within what I am is made of what I am. The apparent form is all awareness arising within itself, aware of itself. This is why wisdom teachings going back thousands of years have referred to life as a, a dream, an illusion, maya. Leela is the play of consciousness. And Maya is the illusion. The play of consciousness is referring to, and consciousness and awareness in this context are interchangeable, that everything arises within God, within consciousness, which is what we really are. Everything is made of God. All there is is God. All there is is consciousness. All there is is source. Now for a while, as part of the play of consciousness, source has hypnotized itself to identify with one of the objects within the dream. To identify with something that it's not. to forget itself. And as a result, to experience something it can't really experience in reality, which is an uncomfortableness of oneself. Suffering. Seeing everything as separate. Feeling fear, competition, rivalry towards the others that it sees as outside of itself and separate to itself. Having identified with an object, which is not what it really is, it then includes within the play of consciousness the deeply ingrained beliefs that what I need as this human physical object is more objects that are outside of myself to make me complete, to make me feel comfortable. And that search for comfort 
comfortableness with oneself happens because there is an uncomfortableness with oneself and that uncomfortableness with oneself has happened because within the play of consciousness there has been an identification with something that we are not a forgetting of what we really are and a result of having forgotten what we are there is an obvious uncomfortableness, like trying to put a glove on that doesn't fit. And the realization, the recognition, the remembering of what we truly are means the end of suffering, the end of the uncomfortableness. A contentment. It means the seeking comes to an end, the attachment to outcomes, the desire for objects as an idea of fulfillment falls away because there is a self-contentedness, a self-fulfillment, a self-fulfillingness of ourself. So abide in I am is, it sounds like an instruction. It sounds like a teacher telling a seeker what to do. It sort of says, sounds like um, <clears throat> the instruction, climb a hundred steps. We have to listen to these pointers differently. Abide in I am is <clears throat> a description, not a prescription, but rather a description of what might start to happen when the effort to try and do abiding in I am stops. And that very much happens simultaneously to the grace of the falling backwards. To abide in I am requires no effort from the seeker. In fact, abiding in I am is the very dissolution of the seeker. The seeker is the one that's saying, oh, I have to abide and I am. And that is the conceptual sense of self, the thinker of the thoughts, which there has been an identification with, doing the seeking. As I mentioned earlier, in the moment of grace when that is seen, and it in a flash is understood to be the very... <coughs> opposite of abiding in I am, the very thing that keeps us outside of the dimension of being. That awareness is always aware without anyone needing to do it. I would suggest a softening of the gaze and allowing the whole of the present moment, all of the visual fields, the sound fields, the taste, the touch, the smells, the thoughts, the emotions, to all be available as a single vista within the field of awareness.
the body is just one of the many seemingly separate ob objects that arise within that vista. If in an instant the present moment is witnessed from not the body but from before the body, where the body is known to be just another object that comes and goes in the ever-changing play of consciousness. And as this door, this dimension, the gateless gate, as it's sometimes referred to, the gateless gate or the open secret, is that that name is used because there's really nothing preventing the gate from opening except for our insistence which is not our doing to open the gate the way that we think the gate has to be opened which is through the thinking through the one that has always tried to live life to do life and in the instant when there is a stopping of that, knowing ourselves differently. Then it becomes obvious that there was never a lock on the gate. It's the equivalent of pushing the door really hard, trying to open it. Feeling as if the door is locked. You're turning the handle and you're pushing and it just won't budge. And you can spend hours and hours trying to open the door by turning the handle and pushing, convinced that you've been locked out. And then in an instant, the flash of insight arises and think, what if I have to stop pushing? And as soon as our idea of how to open the door falls away, the door swings backwards and opens. And in that moment, there is a recognition that it was never locked and that our insistence of how to open the door was what was actually keeping it closed. So the Rumi poem, which I like uh, so much when talking about this topic, says there is a field out, out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in the grass of that field, life is too full to talk about. So if we can interpret the metaphors in line with some of the things I've been saying, it's talking about a field, a dimension, beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing so the the in the metaphor the word the ideas of right doing and wrong doing refer to our concepts our thinking about this is how life should be this is how you should act this is how i should act this is how we shouldn't do things life should be like this shouldn't be like that you are right if you do it this way. You are wrong if you do it that way. So all that is uh, interpretation of what is through thinking. So beyond or prior to transcending is what is implying. If we can transcend the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, then there is a field. I'll meet you there is implying it's the only place we can really meet. It's like when I know myself in that field, then 
we know the other as not separate and not different from what we are. When we are knowing ourself and the other through the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, we're not really knowing the other and in fact what we're doing is alienating, separating, judging. And so we can never know the other truly. So it suggests when the soul falls back into the grass of that field, life is too full to talk about. What it, that, that um, relates to the self-fulfilling essence of what we really are beyond the ideas of who we are in the recognition of what we are, there is a knowing, a sense that everything is okay, that I don't need this and that in order for things to be okay. That is the feeling of uncomfortableness that is there when we abide in the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, which is where we are knowing ourselves in thought. So, so much of um, the human involvement in the flow of life, meaning so much concern about society and how life is turning out, is all associated with the sense, the um, conviction that in order to be complete, I need things out there to be a certain way. And so if that's how we know ourselves, then those things that we think we are dependent on, those things that we feel define us, then we're going to have an opinion and an investment in them being a particular way. So if you see yourself being overly concerned about someone's point of view, about policy, about things that are happening, maybe recognize that this investment, this urgency, the sense of importance in things turning out a certain way may well be because the idea of who we are, which is not what we really are, is in place and is um, attached and invested in those outcomes. And so we're being gently reminded that if we can drop out of that, thinking into our being then life will be too full to talk about in the story of Adam and Eve it's no <clears throat> coincidence that the fall from grace where they were essentially ejected out of the metaphorical garden of um, Eden, which represented heaven, and the fall from grace, which is where, when they were banished from the garden of Eden, and they felt self-conscious, they blamed each other, they felt naked, full of shame, it was after having eaten from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So the knowledge of good and evil in that um, context refers to the thinking mind. This is right, this is wrong, this is how you should act, this is how you shouldn't act. And that is when they suddenly became self-conscious, became knowing themselves differently to how they knew themselves before. It denotes a dropping out of being into identification with an idea of who we are. So when teaching, say, thinking is the problem, 
that we will never know ourselves through the intellect. What that is being said in order to um, encourage a movement away from thought, away from knowledge. There's a Zen story about a scholar that went to see um, a well-respected Zen monk. And he sat down. Um, the monk invited him to have a cup of tea. And he started putting forward all of his ideas about Zen. And after about 10 or 15 minutes of him explaining this and that, the monk suggested that Zen is about emptying his cup, emptying all of his ideas. And the monk demonstrated this by pouring a cup of tea and allowing the tea to overflow on the cup. And the scholar said, you know, what are you doing? He said, this cup is like your mind. It is too full. It's overflowing. And Zen is the emptying of the cup. So the word knowledge can be used in two contexts. In the context of the Adam and Eve story, it was the knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil, evil, which meant the concept of good and evil. So that knowledge would be written with a small k, as in intellectual, conceptual knowledge. And the word understanding can also be used in two contexts, with a small u or a capital U, just like knowledge. If it's understanding with a small u, it would mean intellectual understanding, the understanding of concept. And in non-duality, we sometimes hear about the man of understanding or the woman of understanding. And in that context, that's referring to a sage, liberated person. The understanding is a knowing. And if we talk about this knowing beyond concept, it's a direct being the knowledge. Not a concept of what we are, but being what we are prior to any concept. So this is why the emphasis is sometimes in non-duality. It's you need to know <coughs> oneself experientially. So the, the word experientially is implying not intellectually. Meditation is an opportunity, a space that can come into one's daily movements where the objective, and we have to use this word objective very lightly because it can very easily become part of a maintaining of the me-doer conceptual sense of self. <clears throat> In meditation, the objective is 
an objectiveless objective in a way. It's the absence of an intellectual objective and allowing the present moment to be exactly the way it is, which implies an awareness of how it is. And that awareness is <clears throat> ideally shifts. So when meditation starts, by default, the likelihood is that the, <clears throat> the seeker-doer, the separate self, is going to do the witnessing or try to do the witnessing. And that isn't going to be witnessing, but it's a start. That's going to be observing from the point of the body observing things outside of itself. And even with eyes closed, the conceptual sense of a separate me will be observing in the meditation, which means it's not quite meditation as it can be, but it's a start. And as that becomes recognized <clears throat> with the help of pointers, hopefully, and it becomes seen that there is a doer doing, trying to do the meditation, then this grace, this falling backwards might happen where there is a falling out of someone doing meditation. And when the someone doing meditation dissolves, melts back or falls back into the self, then true meditation arises because the meditator has dissolved. And then there is just meditating happening, which by default is the effortless awareness of everything that is arising moment after moment after moment. Where that which is aware knows that everything that there is awareness of is not outside of itself and not separate from itself. And that knowing in the absence of the one doing the meditation is experiential and non-conceptual. So when we hear that enlightenment is about knowing oneself, the knowing is this <clears throat> direct preconceptual knowing, a being. It's something that the, um, the small self or the uh, self that we are not really, the conceptual self, the doer, seeker, can't actually do. It's like trying to sit and stand at the same time. The conceptual self that is trying to know, it hears, oh, I need to know myself. Okay, how am I going to do this? And it looks in books and it does meditating. Um, it can never know itself because to know what we really are is the dissolution of what we're not. Or at least the disidentification from that. Which means then seeing that movement of thought as simply an object that is known from that which we really are.
So um, if anyone has any questions, we'll open open up for questions. Hi, Marie. Hello, Roger. Hello there. I can hear my own voice echoing. So weird. Um, <laughs> uh, that's... Uh, I have a question, uh, maybe a couple. Um, what would you say depression is, or that feeling of prolonged darkness where you... You know, I listen to your teachings uh, frequently and other ones, and during that time of depression, that nothing e even makes sense because there isn't any, there doesn't seem to be any understanding of it. Or, mm -hmm. I don't know, what would you say that, that state is about, if anything? Um, well, I... W I would say that uh, depression is a form of suffering. Um, it is essentially, I, I, I think it's the attachment, the very deeply ingrained attachment to outcomes, um, sense of doership um, that forms the psychological self that feels very uncomfortable, feels like it isn't succeeding, like it's not good enough, that um, and that uh, there's a heaviness to the, to that, and that then creates a, a sort of feedback cycle where the heaviness um, swamps any enthusiasm or motivation, and it's very uncomfortable. Now, <clears throat> um, it seems that suffering is an integral part of this. Um, this manifestation and it isn't because anyone is making that happen it's simply a consequence of the fact that this manifestation includes the psychological self that <clears throat> um, that is going to feel uncomfortable and so ideally which is not something that we can do. And I also know that this very much may not be available. Ideally, the depression is witnessed as a happening. Um, and as you've said, that in the times of intense suffering, of which I'm suggesting depression is a form, mm, witnessing is completely absent any understanding um, that might be there at other times sort of seems to go completely out of the window. There's no, um, <laughs> there's no sense at all that suffering is just a happening, that it's a feeling that comes and goes, that it's not what we are. Um, but there is the potential that if grace, destiny, um, strikes that maybe the depression can be witnessed essentially from outside of the one that is depressed witnessed from that field of awareness in which it is arising and it is arising in the, in the field of awareness because it is known um, the the unfortunateness about suffering is that the field of awareness that it is arising in is completely sucked in and identified with the feeling and so there's no space no perspective no capacity to see it as impersonal and from outside unless of course grace hits and that happens and if it if that happens 
then it becomes very obvious in the moment that the suffering is not happening to you. Um, that it is simply a movement, an experience, a sensation, an energetic load that is arising within consciousness and that it isn't actually affecting the consciousness in which it arises. Um, but all these words that I'm putting forward are not instructions to someone of something to achieve or something to do when depression is there because it um, is most likely not going to be available. That space isn't going to be available in, in, the, in, in suffering. Unless, of course, <laughs> um, we can call it destiny or grace or some of the concepts that are being put forward here arise in that moment and create a, a shift or um, a seeker finds that the concepts go to work when there isn't suffering um, and witnessing is mm, happening when depression isn't there and then when depression strikes there is more potential for it to be witnessed as a happening because um, the system has been conditioned at times when the depression wasn't there um, to, to witness, which means there's an opening up of um, seeing all of these um, objects in life as exactly that, objects. Um, and if, if that witnessing happens with objects like um, the physical objects, thoughts, feelings, then there's a potential that the very heavy suffering feelings, which are the ones that tend to um, create the contraction the most, which is the opposite of the expansion that sees everything as just an impersonal arising. If, if, if that movement has been strengthened outside of the times when there is depression, then there is more likelihood that there can be some form of witnessing in depression. If you can recognize, if there is a recognition that the depression comes and it goes based on past experience, for example, then that too becomes potentially a very valuable insight because that insight may arise when depression is there. Um, and then there may be a, a non-involvement on some level that says, you know, this is going to be there for as long as it's going to be there. And at some point it will stop. And it will stop not because I make it stop, because if it stopped that way, then everyone would prevent it from arising in the first place. Um, so yeah. we have to realize it doesn't stop because I make it stop, but it comes and it goes. Yeah, that's a good uh, description. Uh, very good. I um, I noticed that uh, simply speaking with other people or people I trust and know, uh, when there's then there's a feeling of um, simple love, flow a flow of love, and this opens up. Uh, is sort of a crack in that separation, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then everything become, can become very clear again. But then I wonder if that's, well, well, I don't care really, but I mean, <laughs> but it seems that a lot of the teachings seem to point to like, oh, you're kind of like, yeah. Uh, You've got to really suffer like on your own and like that somehow it's going to break through you but it's something as simple as sharing with another being or being with another being will mm. will allow that breakthrough and um i don't think that gets talked about very much in non-duality it's almost as if you've got to keep driving down this hole or something and, and if it's not working well it's nobody's doing it or anything so that doesn't really help either Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I noticed was that just something that was told to me a long time ago, just, 
I was walking along and I just said in my mind, you know, just get give me the next right thought or action. I'm not even really sure who I'm talking to, but whenever I would do it throughout the day, it would just be very simple. You know, it would just be like, oh, I'm going to make this soup or I'm going to call this person or whatever whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and it creates some, some gap or simplifies, yeah, simplifies the uh, feeling of existence or, or something. I can't quite describe it. But. Yeah, I, I'm all for any um, anything someone um, sees, uh, recognizes that helps. I think um, we that's very valid and um you know in a way if you have a headache and you can take a panadol paracetamol whatever why not um sometimes we th- think you know oh i have to conquer it some other way um <laughs> and we as, and that thought can get in the way of maybe a very practical fix um we also need to recognize sometimes whether something is um, a, a real solution or, well, I won't even say a real solution because my previous statement says, well, even everything is a real solution. It, it just needs to be in context. So sometimes um, we can do something that helps, but we can also recognize that it's not the ultimate solution because if we don't realize that then it might get in the way of us trying something else um so i'm not about excluding anything but at the same time i wouldn't get too fixated on any one thing either because it can get in the way of alternatives um so one of the things that is mentioned with techniques is that eventually techniques stop working um and we can see that for ourselves is that you know you can go for a, do some exercise when you're depressed or feeling bad and at a particular time that's the trick that will work and yet we know that you can have a bout of um uncomfortableness depression that is so strong that there just simply isn't even the potential to, to, to get, you know, to move to do the exercise. Um, or you, you do the exercise and it doesn't, in that particular instance, work. Whereas it might in, you know, in, on other occasions. And so it's, that's actually very useful in a way for that to be recognized because we will then see the non-absoluteness of any fix that we might come up with um, which isn't to say oh it's not a valid um, fix that it shouldn't be left in the in the toolbox um, but it gets put into perspective um, and so there is there's a um, method to the madness of some of the non-dual concepts and at the same time um, they're not truth as in no teaching no concept is the truth they're just pointers that um, hopefully don't become too uh, believed as truth because then they in themselves will become problematic um, so, yeah, the more that we investigate, learn from observation, um, then uh, I think the, the more familiar we become with something and ultimately um, under constant scrutiny, constant awareness, the patterns will become more and more apparent. Yeah. And if I could ask one more question. Um, mm-hmm. 
what would you say is the simplest form of meditation? I always, I always get a bit stuck there, like, what is this thing? I mean... Um, I like the description of simply allowing everything to be as it is. Um, so there is no um, technique, there is no objective. It's not about a meditation being full of silence because, you know, as soon as we say, oh, I have to meditate for 15 minutes without a thought, if it's destiny for there to be thoughts, then essentially there will be a, a resistance to the fact that there were thoughts when our goal, our objective was to meditate with no thought. So allowing everything to be as it is is a way of essentially dropping any objective, dropping any benchmarks. And the emphasis is then on the awareness of what is, which includes awareness of the busy mind, if the mind is busy. Um, and if, we, if there is an awareness of the busy mind and maybe an awareness of the awareness of the busy mind, that is an opening up beyond involvement in the busy mind. If there is, you know, a struggle against the fact that I'm trying to meditate and there's a busy mind, then that involvement, that struggle against the busy mind essentially is involvement with the busy mind, which means there isn't a, a transcendence of that. So um, this allowing everything to be as it is, is... Um, is to me the simplest and most, um, I can't say it's the most true meditation because, um, you know, someone may not be um, suited or ready, they're, they're in a structure, might not be ready to meditate like that. Um, and then a, a, a guided meditation or a, um, visualizing colors or light or any other number of um, meditation techniques may well be more appropriate. Uh, but I tend not to, I don't know any of them actually. <laughs> um, meditation for me was always about um, awareness becoming aware of itself and aware of everything that is coming and going within itself. Thank you very much. Mm, you're welcome. Thanks for dropping in. Hello, Cecilia. Hello, Roger. Hi. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can formulate this because it's so difficult to talk about with words, right? Mm. Um, well, I don't find it so that. hard, but <laughs> maybe I'm oh, missing yeah. the point. I love to listen to you. Um, precisely in trying to have the awareness become aware that it is aware, mm -hmm. right? Um, the preconceptual self, the understanding with a capital U that I am not the body and I am not the mind. Um, I've surmised that one technique would be to, uh, when thoughts arise, to ignore and relax. Mm -hmm. to ignore and relax, to be vigilant and to ignore and relax. Um, and I've tried to sit down in meditation and do this, but I find it's easier if I do this going about my daily life, every, mm -hmm. every second, every minute, trying to reside just in beingness in the present. And if thoughts arise, to ignore them and to rest, relax, and then just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I would really, really love it if you could um, maybe speak a little bit about what you think would be another or better um, technique precisely to become, to get in touch with the pre-conceptualized self. Mm. Okay. Because uh, like in meditation or not or whatever, what can I do? So that I don't dwell in concept precisely that I can, well, not I, but that 
yeah, mm. <laughs> that my real existence can have an awareness of precisely that this is the story of me. Yeah, <laughs> so the, the, the doer, the doer <laughs> has to not be there. Um, and that's not your... So not, how, do do that? how do I do that? You see, how well, can I work on that? Don't take it personally, but what an absurd question, right? The doer has to yeah, be gone. Is. And it's like, oh, so tell me how to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the doer reasserts itself um, over and over and over. Um, it, you know, the doer wants to know what to do. And meditation is the death of the doer. Um, so I can't give the doer an answer. <laughs> Um, what we need to how see is... One, how can one get there? Yeah, how can one get there? How can one not do? That's right. So um, essentially it's like in... So this is why um, a question like yours is so valuable because my answer will be, you know, hopefully coming at it from this angle. And um, then in the course of daily life while... You know, there is this interest in meditating and uh, the doer trying to do it, which is inevitable because for as long as the doer is alive and kicking, it is going to be trying to run the show through its normal way of, you know, controlling and making things happen and um, asserting itself. So it doesn't want to die. Um, and what I'm talking about really is the dying of the doer, but the doer doesn't kill itself. Um, so if the doer says, tell me how to kill myself, that's the doer staying alive. So um, that's what we have to sort of realize is, oh, wow, I can never do it. And so the doer would say, well, if I can't do it, it's not going to happen because the doer thinks that it makes everything happen. And the only way that things happen is if it does it. And the whole teaching really is saying life has never been happening because of a doer. Life is a happening. And the doer is, is part of the happening of life. And for as long as the doer is active as part of the happening of life. So the doer doesn't even do the doer. The doer is... A happening. Um, it's sort of what we could call destiny at a particular point in time is for the doer to be part of the story. And we could say the author introduced the doer and until the author kills off the doer, the doer will be part of the story and coloring it or being, yeah, creating the effect of the doer being part of the story. Um, and destiny can include the death of the doer and preceding the death of the doer, it may include a description about the doer um, and a description about how the doer can come to an end, but not through the doer's doing. Um, and that's the mystery of life is that it's, it, it can happen because life is always happening. Um, and if something arises in the moment where a, a glimpse of recognition is that, oh, the doer trying to do it is the perpetuating of, let's say, non-meditation. Um, it's the perpetuation of the meditator. And meditation is the absence of the meditator, ironically. Um, and um, so simply, you know, even contemplating that, meditation is the absence of the meditator, which the contemplation will probably be a contemplation by the, the doing intellect at first, but then it might shift to being um, where there's an understanding that 
where the contemplation turns into a silence. Because really the absence of the doer, the absence of the meditator, is silence. That, that turning inwards, that rolling backwards, is where we stop. Stop trying to do it. Mm-hmm. And if sometimes if I say stop, it can lead to a stop and it's like or it can lead to I could say stop and then there's a, a but you know um, on on your side let's say on the think the thinking will say oh, how do I stop <laughs> um, which is the opposite of stopping right the, the thought how do I stop is a continuation and it's just stop and if the doer is hearing it and it says, okay, I've got an instruction to stop, well, um, I'm not sure how to stop. That is the going, you know, that is the non-stopping. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is this amazing thing of some, it's, let's call it grace, where something just happens differently. And usually it happens differently because as a result of prolonged um, investigation or um, interest, the, the doer thought, the one trying to do it, even asking, how do I stop, is seen. And it's like, in an instant, it's caught. And the working mind, which is the part of the intellect that is not the doer, just get, realizes oh, it's about stopping. And it, in, its, in the realization it's about stopping, that thought it's about stopping becomes the bookend and there's a stopping. And in the stopping, it's like, ah, it, there's just being, because the irony is that the essence of what we are has always been there, is always there. It's, it doesn't, the essence of what we are doesn't go anywhere when the thinking of how to do this, how do I, where, you know, where's knowledge to be found, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, which is why we're told that you don't need to make anything happen, you don't have to go anywhere, you're already sitting on the treasure. Um, it's all of that is implying just stop and what you are will get a chance to reveal itself and it sounds like instructions right um even just stop sounds like an instruction and so it for a while will be taken as okay i'm going to stop and that's not as tragic as it sounds because the very movement to try and stop will eventually be seen as the absence of stopping and in an instant the stopping might happen when it's seen. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's what Papaji kept saying, just be quiet. So always abiding in that second of beingness mm-hmm. constantly. But there's nothing else but just beingness. Yes. Um, but... Um, you know, if we, it, it's bound to happen very slowly, like strengthening a muscle. Um, and so if we interpret that which you've described as what Papaji said is abiding in being constantly, um, if it doesn't happen in a constant way for us, we might feel like, oh, I, I didn't, it didn't happen. Whereas the abiding can start off with just a split second of abiding and then we get dragged back into thinking. Um, And so it's a bit like rehabilitating a muscle is that, you know, if you you become paralyzed, let's say, or nerve damage and you then have to retrain that that muscle, 
um, the first week might seem like there's no progress. And if you conclude, oh, this is getting me nowhere, and stop after the first week, you may be cutting the process short because the first week, even though there might not be any perceptible pro uh, progress, is the beginning of the rehabilitation. And um, as the rehabilitation gets more and more progressed, there is a sort of snowballing effect as the muscles get stronger, as the signals to the nerves get stronger, or the signal from the, from the brain to the nerves, however it, it you know, works. Um, as that starts to build, it builds on itself, and there's more and more progress that happens quicker and quicker. Um, so this abiding in I am is like strengthening a muscle and a bit or like clearing a path through a jungle you know you might start off macheteing um vines and whatever and eventually the more times that that path is trodden the easier it becomes to to move um from one point a to point b and it's the same with abiding in i am it starts off where it seems like nothing is happening and then we might get a, a second, half a second, might go up to two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, a minute. Um, and then it becomes a muscle that essential or a movement that, uh, that becomes second nature or first nature even. And that's when eventually we can say, oh, there is no longer an abiding outside of what I am. Um, which used to be the default. We used to, by default, we've sort of forgotten who we are and we're caught in this conceptual um, movement, which is a happening, right? No one has um, failed. It's just how the, the, the development process of this story of life goes, um, where humans tend to develop in a way that we live life through thought and spiritual seeking is a redirecting us back to home um, where we really can be and live life from this other place so um, yeah treat it I would treat it as um, some a practice but without a practicer because the very act of dropping into being is the absence of the practicer and are just a stopping um, if it happens. So Nisargadatta got the instruction, which is not really an instruction, it's a description from his guru. Um, sounds like an instruction, sounds like abide in I am is an instruction. Um, and he said for four years that was what he would keep remembering, abide in I am. So the, the thought I am can be your reminder and that thought i am is essentially a reminder to drop into the the experiential knowing of existence um mm -hmm. so it isn't about just repeating i am as a thought but rather the thought i am is a reminder to drop out of the conceptual self into the non-conceptual being If I can just ask something that probably has no answer, because, but it, I am, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure because I can't know, but you have experienced, you have experienced the absolute, like, and I would imagine from you, you speaking and what you tell us that you have had this, you have the experience, you can abide there, or is it, is it a place of nothingness or is it, pla is it a place uh, that is pregnant with something that cannot be spoken about? Um, well, I'd preface any answer um, by saying, you know, something I repeat that teachings are exactly that. They are um, a set of concepts that are delivered um, to 
the the mind that needs those concepts and so um the the concept of the absolute which we could say is a pointer right a pointer to what lies beyond the concept of the absolute um and and so what we would say is okay that which lies beyond the concept of the absolute <coughs> is the absolute um now so the 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 fact is there an absolute um because if i say yes i'm familiar with the absolute it then implies that there is an absolute that roger is or, or maybe not roger is familiar with but that there is a connection to or an abiding in um and i would say yes i'm familiar with the absolute but what the absolute turns out to be is maybe different from uh what we might um discern from the word absolute and um we might even at some point say that what is described as the absolute becomes apparent that it's not actually that absolute <laughs> um this is why at some point i think in our seeking uh it then it needs to become about what i would say the journey is really about which is peace of mind um a movement into what we can call the absolute which for a while is treated as the objective um because that's all that's talked about let's say um at a certain point of our journey um the self and the absolute is like this whole this whole satsang has been about being and dropping into into the self um why is that important why is knowing oneself important um so uh, le let's let's let me just say one of the reasons why the absolute is called the absolute is because relative to thinking it if you put the two together thinking and being it makes sense that you'll call one completely changeable and the other unchanging and so if that's the case and you're thinking of how to communicate it and how to maybe a, um bring about a recognition of what we're talking about then you oh using the word absolute is great and so it gets put in as a teaching that self realization is about the realizing of that of the absolute um and so being can for a while be seen as the absolute and then there might come a time when we see the absence of being as something that may well happen within the manifestation um like in deep sleep what we become aware of as the absolute and we say this are oh, this is the absolute because it is essentially prior to any thinking prior to any emotions and relative to all of those things that are changing it appears to be absolute and then if we have a um a moment of insight and say well do i know that that absolute doesn't ever stop and we look at our own experience rather than just believing a concept that says the absolute is present even in deep sleep right because if we if we take that concept which is in some teachings and we just say oh that's true then what we're referring to as the absolute can remain absolute because we're told it remains in deep sleep but if we question it based on our own experience and say am i aware of the absolute or are there times when awareness of the absolute falls away so there is awareness of the absolute in the waking state but are there 
times when awareness of the absolute falls away. And we have to um, at, loose, at least include the possibility that awareness of the absolute falls away because the, we, we wouldn't know if it has fallen away. Because by default, if awareness of the absolute by the absolute falls away, it wouldn't be known. So we wouldn't actually be able to say, oh yes, I didn't know the absolute. Because we wouldn't know that we didn't know the absolute. Um, and so we, might, we say, well, I don't know that the absolute is that absolute. Because the awareness of it, the awareness of itself, which in the waking state is what is referred to as the knowing of the absolute, may, f may change, it may f fall away. So at some point we go, oh, maybe it's not about the absolute or the self. Maybe a, a, an awareness of those things allows us to then be able to function in daily life free of suffering and so i think it's very powerful to come back to peace of mind as being really what we're looking for so i would say that my journey has taken me to taken um, awareness of awareness awareness of the absence of many aspects of the manifestation and luckily I came to meet Ramesh and he said well that's all well and good but um, in practical terms what seeking and what liberation is really about is the end of suffering which is peace of mind um, and uh, I think that's very relevant to keep in mind Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Hi, Lupe. Oh. Hello, can Lupe. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I could, what's happened, maybe. Okay, now you can hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, all right. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll do that too. Oh no, I need. Unmute. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. because I've not uh, had a chance to be with you because it's too early and my husband is in the same room and um, I don't have a question. I wanted to tell you how practical uh, you have helped me because my husband got laid off in December and if I had not had your teaching... I already would have left him. And what kept me with him is that I knew it, he wasn't the doer. And I kept saying, I know the absolute about Dave. The absolute about Dave is that he's loving and he's kind and he's considerate. And that's the absolute. That's very practicable to me. But what he was doing is he was raging and he was angry because he wanted to work till the day he died. And yet I kept knowing then thank you to you for that whole year while COVID was on in that place. I knew that the only thing I'm wanting to do is feel comfortable within myself, mm -hmm. but it is not dependent on the circumstance outside of myself. And I began to say, you know, he's acting like my grandson. He's having a tizzy fit. And when a child is having a tizzy fit, he is not the doer. He's in total reaction, like you were telling about how when you're angry, you know, it's a reflex. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to thank you. You have saved my marriage, <laughs> <laughs> the teaching, because 
I can maintain my peace of mind, which is what I love about this teaching, is that that's all it's about. It's about peace and daily living, even while your husband is having a tizzy fit because he's been laid off and he is not the doer. Mm. I know it. Yeah, that's... And I want to thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks for commenting, Lupe. Yeah, if you if we realize that the different forms of thought, the guilt, the blame, the pride, the expectation of how life should and shouldn't be and the continuous commenting and the worry, if we see that um, those different movements of thought and feeling are our uncomfortableness, if there is this connection to self which allows us to drop outside of the, the, that stream of thinking, um, then that's where we realize peace of mind happens and peace of mind is simply the absence of the thinking mind that feels so uncomfortable. The blame, the expectation, the judgment, the fear. So this is wonderful that uh, uh, life has brought about a movement away from judging and it seems like the notion that you know all of us are instruments of life and everyone is doing exactly what they're destined to do in each moment based on their makeup the role they have to play in the play of life um, that understanding has been it sounds like the catalyst to cut off the blame to cut off the um, judgment and to see life as life unfolding right and it is a wonderful teaching i am just amazed how just that one concept of i'm trying to orchestrate my outside uh field to just so that i can feel comfortable within myself and there was a lady talking about depression what i I've had a uh, borderline uh, depression all my life. So what I noticed about that is that when I don't get my way and I feel helpless, that's where I go into depression because I think that I, I can control life. And this teaching has made me see, oh, no, you cannot because you are not the, the doer. So you have to watch life and just allow it. Mm -hmm. Allow whatever is happening you're not the doer, you're not the controller, you can't fix it, change it. You just have to allow and watch it. Watch it like you do the child who's having the tantrum <laughs> and say, oh, this is nice and because eventually it will pass. And that's what, what brings me the peace of mind, knowing that mm -hmm. I don't have to be in reaction to the outside of seeing that I can stop like you said, drop into who I know I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not the person, that's for sure. <laughs> I am the absolute. And I love that about this teaching. Mm. Yeah, that's so this notion that, um, you know, what we what our thinking has done is because we are attached, we our conceptual self feels like we need pleasure to be complete, that we need pleasure to fulfill ourselves. Um, that uh, investment in pleasure, that attachment to pleasure, that sort of craving, desire, that urgency, almost, you know, to the extent where on a very deep level, we feel I will die without pleasure, because we, we think it's sort of like being starved of oxygen. Um, that has prevented us from seeing the the oneness of life now um the oneness of life is duality um so the non-duality of life the oneness of life is to recognize this is the irony the duality of pleasure and pain so it's very much like the yin yang symbol so to see the whole yin yang symbol means to understand that the yin yang symbol is the balance of black and white um, that they that there is no yin yang symbol if you exclude the black and only want the white um, 
and life is sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. And our desire for pleasure, our sense that I need it, it is what I am dependent on, has prevented us from accepting the inevitable sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. And so when life turns out like it always will, um, its nature, sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain, the psychological self rebels against the pain of life. Um, and that rebelling against the pain of life is the separation. It's the um, turning the whole into what we want and what we don't want. And so stepping back and being able to accept the flow of life as sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain is the end of separation, the end of um, essentially saying, I want the white, but something is wrong when there is the black. And the only way this becomes feasible is if we can drop into the self that we've been talking about such that it, re it is revealed experientially that my happiness, my contentness, my beingness is not dependent on pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And so from that place, the sense of urgency for life to deliver just pleasure falls away because the inevitable arising of pain is no longer seen as a threat, a challenge to who I am. And that then brings into play the potential that you describe, which is to be able to sit back and witness life happen, including both the pleasure and the pain. Um, so thank you for your yeah. comments. Okay. Yes, that's what that's what was the cherry on the cake is that my awareness of that it was either I was seeking pleasure or I was in resistance to pain. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized that it's neither black or white, that that which we are calling the true self or the absolute just is aware and it doesn't judge. And mm -hmm. I was able to get to that place that I've studied for all my life called stillness. And that's what it is. It's neither seeking nor resisting it's just being mm -hmm. it was absolutely i mean i trust me i was suffering <laughs> until i said okay now you have to remember what roger says this is about peace of mind he's done it i can do it and so this is what I, it is it's just being still neither seeking nor resisting that that's so i my gratitude like i said the day I win the lottery, you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for you then. No. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad I was able to join today, but I can't when I'm in uh, Oakland. But I'm visiting my son right now. So I was glad to share with you how much you have helped me. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thank you, Lupe. On that note, I think uh, we'll bring to an end. Oh, just uh, I'll give another plug for the intensives. Um, it start, they start in about seven or eight days on the 26th for me, 25th for the guys in the US, the evening of the 25th. Um, the first one is the framework, um, which we didn't talk about much today, a little bit towards the end. Um, uh, so the first intensive at the end of July on the 26th is about the framework and details are on the website under the events section. So um, if you feel inclined to join that six days in a row, two hours each day, just focusing on the framework. Um, I look forward to seeing those who have already signed up um, and we'll be back next week for the satsang on my Saturday evening. Thank you. Peace.